Teresha uh, Wise Draper from University of Cincinnati presented a um, small multi-center trial that looked at pathologic response and disease-free survival among patients with locally advanced head and neck cancer who received neoadjuvant pembrolizumab and then received pembrolizumab as part of their post-operative therapy. So this was a um, single cohort uh, trial, uh, that is to say there was no randomization, but it mimics a little bit the, the design of the Keynote 689 trial, which is currently ongoing. So it's extremely interesting to be able to, to see these data. It was a very uh, advanced patient population. So a lot of T3, T4 disease, a lot of N2A uh, through N3 disease. And patients received uh, pembrolizumab. Then they went to surgery. And then they were uh, offered post-operative therapy that was risk-adjusted based on the findings at surgery. So uh, if they had high-risk disease, positive margins, extranodal extension, they were assigned to a treatment where they received radiation, cisplatin, and pembrolizumab. And if they met the intermediate uh, risk uh, definition, which is to say um, that they did not have e e or um, a positive margin, they received radiation with pembrolizumab alone. The hypothesis was that for uh, radiation cisplatin um, in the high-risk population, the um, one-year disease-free survival ought to be about uh, 65 to 67%. And in the um, in the favorable risk group uh, getting radiation alone, it should be about 69 or 70%. And they were interested in seeing whether or not the uh, incorporation of neoadjuvant pembrolizumab would change that. And then they also did a very uh, elegant analysis of who was most likely to respond to the neoadjuvant pembrolizumab by using nanostring and PDL1 quantitation. And they uh, used a um, response definition that uh, incorporated the immune response pathologic criteria that had been developed by Dr. Upaluri in, in the pilot experience with neoadjuvant pembrolizumab. So uh, they found a uh, treatment effect in um, uh, about 40% of the patients. And there were 39 patients who ended up being assigned to the intermediate risk group. They saw a uh, outcome in the high risk group that was comparable to the historical uh, controls that they had taken from NRG trials. But in the uh, favorable risk group, the uh, use of neoadjuvant pembrolizumab followed by surgery, followed by radiation with pembrolizumab, led to very, very remarkable um, one-year disease-free survival of over 95% and, and overall survival of 100%. I think the, um, the, these, these are obviously stunning data. I think the complication in um, understanding them is that the outcome really may be a reflection of what kind of biology is it that responds uh, so well to pembrolizumab? Are these uh, tumors that are less hypoxic, that are, that are smaller, that uh, have less immune exclusion? And so um, to change the post-operative therapy on the basis of response to new adjuvant therapy is obviously extremely attractive in a pragmatic, patient-centered uh, view of things because uh, th this is an, a nice thing if it allows patients to avoid cisplatin and have a high certainty of uh, one-year survival. The complication is, uh, uh, what are you really learning about what pembrolizumab is contributing to the, the overall post-operative therapy? And, and is that result really comparable to patients who have intermediate risk disease uh, who are not previously selected by response to IO? It's not uh, practice changing. It, it certainly provides a lot of enthusiasm for continued accrual to the Keynote 689 trial. The uh, correlative studies, as I, as I mentioned, uh, really were very, very elegant. There was uh, clear evidence that having pdl one expression with a CPS 20 or higher was very predictive of uh, response to new adjuvant pembrolizumab as uh, determined by these um, immune pathologic response criteria. 
And uh, they also developed a, a nanostring signature that incorporated IDO uh, PD-1, PD-L1 um, that seemed to be uh, predictive of response. There, there were um, interesting findings as well about changes uh, before, between baseline and um, post-treatment um, uh, tissue. And so extremely valuable study, uh, very exciting, provides a lot of support, I think, for the, for the ongoing phase three. I think um, given the complexities of the shift in, in who might be in that patient population relative to their historical control, um, I think it's, it's complicated to understand from a single cohort study like this, how it, how it might impact practice. One of the interesting questions that, that can be posed when you look at uh, this trial design is what is the advantage of giving neo neoadjuvant pembrolizumab in a group of patients where you know that you're going to be taking the patient to, to surgery? And I think we're still figuring that out, but one of the things is this uh, suggestion, both from Dr. Abaluri's work, from the nivolumab study conducted by um, Dr. Ferris, and, and now from today's presentation by Dr. Wise Draper, that the um, tumors that have previously been unperturbed by radiation or surgery in, in head and neck cancer appear to be a little bit more sensitive to immune checkpoint inhibition. So that is uh, one, I, th I think, strong rationale to explore it uh, very early on is, is that you may have a larger proportion of patients who benefit from it. If we had um, the ability to understand upfront in whom this kind of treatment could spare the morbidity of our, our conventional definitive therapy, that is to say, allow you to do a less extensive operation, increase your confidence in negative margins, increase the, the, the size of the population that goes forward to uh, less intensive post-operative therapy. That obviously also would be very appealing. And I think the randomized design in the, in the ongoing phase three trial will be very helpful there. Um, I think a, a further uh, consideration is whether sensitivity to chemotherapy and radiation in the post-operative setting could be enhanced by, um, by pre-exposure to immunotherapy. There's certainly been a description in head and neck cancer in the advanced disease and the metastatic recurrence setting that um, patients who've been chemotherapy refractory or re-exposed to chemotherapy after uh, an immune checkpoint inhibitor may be more sensitive. So we, I think, have just so much more to learn about um, how to employ these agents in the curative setting, but the, the data from this presentation uh, certainly in, in, increase, I think, our enthusiasm for studying it um, in patients who are going to surgery. Mm -hmm.